Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig DL, I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal and this week I'm joined by a special guest Kevin Anderson who was a member of the evidence group of the Scottish Climate Assembly. Now this Climate Assembly is something that we talked about on the podcast just a few months ago back in March um, when we we spoke to Ian Stewart and Ellie Clark. Ellie was uh, one of the citizen members of the Assembly. They talked about the experience of being on the Assembly and they talked about the process of setting up the Assembly. But now, last week, as we record this, the Assembly has published its final report with 82 recommendations for the Scottish Government. For the Scottish Government. Um, so, Kevin, hello. Welcome to the show. It's nice to be here. Nice to join you. Hi, right. can, can we just start by talking a little bit, just introduce yourself um, and, and how you got involved with the Assembly? Okay, well, um, I'm Kevin Anderson. I'm a professor of energy and climate change at the University of Manchester. And I suppose it's because I've got that background of working on energy and climate change that I was contacted by some of the um, Scottish Assembly members to, to, to say, would I like to be part of the evidence group trying to collect together the information that the members would get to hear? Um, and so I think given that background and sort of my engagement with these issues is why, why the Scottish um, uh, Secretariat came to me to ask me to join. And I, it's probably also worth noting that I did spend 10 years working in the petrochemical industry, uh, quite a lot of that actually offshore in um, in Scotland. Oh, we won't hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there are lots a, of good people working offshore. <laughs> no, I've, I've many, of my, many of my friends have uh, work or have worked in the industry and I almost went down that path myself. Um, <laughs> so the just just to... Uh, as a very brief summary for listeners who maybe haven't listened to the, the previous episode on the Scottish Climate Assembly, uh, this, this Climate Assembly was, is the second Citizens' Assembly for, for Scotland, following on from a more general Citizens' Assembly in 2019. Um, this is a new way of really deliberative uh, and active democracy where you gather together a group of people who represent the population of Scotland. So this, this assembly was formed of about 100 people. They were randomly selected, but then that random selection was, was tweaked and balanced so that the, the, the people who ended up on the assembly uh, were balanced across gender, across income, across age and uh, location in the, in the country. So you really end up with what's called a, a mini public representative, representative of the, the country. And it's I, I was privileged enough to, to be one of those who were brought in to, to give a bit of evidence um, to, to the Assembly. I, I came along for three weekends and, and um, presented a, a short video on, on my own position on what Scotland should do in various aspects of um, the, the climate emergency and, and stayed around to answer questions and answers. And for me personally, it was a fascinating experience having this tiny little keyhole into these discussions. Um, but Kevin, how did you find that process going back from sort of gathering together the, the various experts in the field and, and throwing them at the assembly? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there were two parts of this for me in terms of feeling. The first part, and I, you know, I, I, I always take the view that as an academic, I have to say it as I see it. And um, I, you know, I think probably the most challenging part for me was some of the early discussions with some of my academic colleagues um, about who, who were the appropriate people to bring in for evidence and what sort of evidence we felt was appropriate for the members to get to hear. And, and although we always like to think you know, the, the evidence will be completely objective, of course, who you choose and so forth is, is an important part of painting a balanced picture. And there was quite a lot of um, healthy and, and courteous disagreement about the, about the relevant expertise. But we settled in, eventually we settled down to, to a sort of a, um, quite a wide cohort of people. But that was quite a, a challenging process, but not that dissimilar to a lot of the ongoing discussions that we have as academics. But the next part of the process, actually getting involved with the members was really uplifting. I mean, I, I suppose it's, often as an academic we it's too easy to dismiss sort of like like, like if you call it like lay expertise the way that um that the people who aren't an expert in a field might view it but the, yeah. well, i think it's really key that we start to listen much more particularly on issues that that have that are very wide ranging so something i mean that if you like the climate change science we, there's probably not a lot that, that, that the lay person can say about the actual science itself but about what we should do about um, our commitments in terms of climate change and how we respond in terms of policies and should, who should the policies affect issues of fairness and all this other side of things and they, they are absolutely key in understanding 
you know, you know that sort of terrain if you like that sort of policy landscape um and it's too easy i think for experts to dismiss um, lay members and uh, to me that was really eye-opening again because every time every time i engage with the public which i do quite a lot with my other work um i'm always sort of surprised uh, just at, at how insightful a lot of the um, mm. suggestions are yeah so how did you find the process of presenting the evidence to the assembly in that in that regard and and um did you find that these complex issues had to be broken down a lot or, or as you say did, did you find a lot of folk just came in with quite a quite a lot, a lot of knowledge and did you see that how helpful was that evidence to the members did you see that their opinions really being formed by by the by these presentations mm. well in the early weekends that we had with the members i mean a lot of the time it's really just uh, sort of providing information for them to start to develop their own views from because it, i mean i think they, i think the members would agree with that with only with, with a few exceptions that that most of them had very little knowledge of the issues um and so to start with it was it was a big learning curve for them and <laughs> i mean I'm, again i'm sure some people really struggled but but by and large i was really amazed by how fast um the the, you know, the, the members managed to pick up the the, the nuances of the science, the, the policy landscape, uh, the different things that we were asked to address within the uh, within the assembly. So it, it, that was really again quite a surprise to me how fast people could get together, get get up with information. And that was partly because the way that we'd been asked as evidence leads to make sure that our information was um, accessible. Um, and then there was often a Q and A afterwards or a discussion afterwards um, with the members. And then the members would go away in their own um, sort of little breakout groups and discuss amongst themselves um with with someone there to, to, to guide them as well so the whole process in that sense worked really well for them to get a good basis from which to start to develop their views um and i'm sure people had some sort of some sort of sense of what they thought was important in relation to climate change but i you could actually see you know people coming up with different or, or being surprised by some of the information they heard and then coming up with different uh, suggestions as a result mm -hmm. so it was very much a learning process i think a learning process for all you know, as much the experts as it was for the uh, for the lay members so yeah when we talk about the we're going to talk about some of the policy recommendations in the report in a few minutes but what can you say about the, the the process of how those recommendations were formed and honed and then finally decided yeah, well, well, we didn't really get on to thinking about the actual recommendations by the members until you know, quite a long way through the process. And that was because, of course, they needed to have the information on which to develop their thoughts and their suggestions. So it was the later weekends when that started to happen. Um, and it was quite an iterative process. They had all this information. Um, they had to start to sort of start to pull this together with and and quite quickly what came out sort of certain themes that they would focus upon and, with, and that was produced with some guidance with with um, some of the secretariat members and so forth so there were some set themes and then people were in sort of if you like little expert breakout groups that would then focus on those particular themes and they would come up with suggestions that would then go back if you like to plenary to everyone else to sort of talk about and discuss and then they can be they'd be honed again so there's a there's a sort of a, an iterative process of going backwards and forwards from sort of some sort of quite generic sort of suggestions then tightening them up a bit further then honing them and then um, revisiting them again amongst the, the whole group and then honing them again until eventually comes some quite sort of specific suggestions that were really sort of aimed this is the sort these are the sorts of things that the policymakers need to seriously think about in a sort of language that's appropriate for policymakers so it was an ongoing process it wasn't there was nothing there was no sort of top down in this it was a um quite an emergent process yeah and is, is, was this also a good process for for finding a consensus of, or, or across disagreements? Um, yes, but it, it, it certainly, I mean, the consensus occurred on, a, on, on well, you can see the recommendations on, on many of the recommendations. They're the ones that we tend to pull out. But I also think we mustn't forget that, that there's real benefit when there isn't a consensus as well. So there are lots of other really wonderful suggestions that did not make it into the final document. Um, and these suggestions were things that needed, there was some disagreement. So they, so, um, but you know, that disagreement itself is quite healthy and i think there's actually something to be said that uh, the often disagreement occurs because maybe not enough information is there to mm. to provide some sort of sense of consensus so i think whilst the final report is really focused on the, all the consensual um elements that came out of that process we mustn't dismiss the rest of it where there's some really good suggestions that were were not always popular with everyone yeah i, I can certainly think of a few examples in other areas of of 
um, of policy and politics where I've been involved in a campaign that has initially started off, you know, either from a position of having no knowledge whatsoever about it. The, the, the example I often use is universal basic income. When, it, when I first started getting involved in that, it was one of these far radical ideas that were only the wildest of dreamers ever thought about universal basic income. Well, in Scotland now, we're, we're in a situation where the Scottish Parliament is... is almost united in favour of a universal basic income. There's only one party in that parliament who's against it. Mm. And that's only in the process of less than 10 years. Yeah, of course, I mean, that was one of the suggestions that came out within the final report. So it's interesting that whilst I, I thought that what the a lot of disagreement would occur from people's particularly you know, particular views on politics, so some people would be maybe more right wing or more left wing, or whatever it might be, and that that would actually colour the things that whether there was more consensus on or not. But it was actually quite a surprise there, and perhaps that's because Scotland is more unified it is, it, that, than perhaps the UK is as a whole. Um, but they, but but these often these sort of what were quite sort of politically charged issues tended to have quite a high consensus to them, which, which mm. I, I found again surprising. Um, but I think that was probably more um, a product of being Scotland. I think probably you could have had something similar, say in, in perhaps something similar in Wales. Um, but I think it's the UK as a whole. You wouldn't have seen that degree of consensus emerging on what were really quite political issues. Mm. Well, maybe the, the the scientist in me tells me that's an excuse for more citizens' assemblies, so we can test that hypothesis. <laughs> well, I mean, certainly, I, as someone who went into this process um, healthily sceptical about what about their value, um, I came out of it thinking, actually, I think there's real scope for, for more citizens' assemblies. Um, and I, I there's certain things I learned from this process about thinking how you could perhaps in, in the future, but like all of this, you know, we, we're in the early days of China, this is one of the, one of the um, tools of democracy, if you like. Yeah, and, and um, I was going to get to the, a bit, this a bit later, but may, may as well discuss it now. It, 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 is this something that you could see as a, a becoming a regular part of democracy? Uh, e either this kind of citizen assembly where you have a topic, or maybe something similar to the, the 2019 assembly, where you have a, a more general canvassing of views. Hmm. I, I certainly think so, but, but not without some reservations. Um, there's a tendency in, in some in politics to try to, to, if you like, to sort of tailor such things to give the results that they want to hear. And I think we have to recognise there are real powers trying to do that. And that in producing something like a Citizens' Assembly, there's a, it's really essential that it is independent of government. It is independent of the establishment and, and voices from, from all spectrums are allowed to be heard. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, I will be, perhaps be a, a little provocative here and say, I, I don't feel the UK Climate Assembly had that degree of autonomy. I felt that was much, much more controlled um, by the establishment in a particular way, which I won't go into now, but I mean, it felt very much more like that. The Scottish one, um, though, was not as open as I would have, you know, as, as ideally I would have liked, but it was nevertheless much more open than the, than the UK one. So I, I think the Scottish one was a really good example of, of a progression towards what citizen assemblies should be. Um, and as, as I say, as someone who's healthily sceptical about them to start off with, I think they have a real lot a real potential for uh, um, us generating a much more um, open, engaged democracy. Um, particularly at a time, I think, when there's a lot of disillusionment with democracy, which uh, yeah. you know, is sometimes misplaced. I think we, we're obviously unnecessarily cynical about um, about some of our policymakers. I mean, certainly there's some there's some many bad eggs in there, but there are also some wonderful people in politics. But I think perhaps opening up to the citizens' assemblies may actually uh, allow us to think it was more more about it being our democracy, which of course is, is ultimately what it is. Yeah. Um, no disagreement there. Uh, so let's let's talk about the, the recommendations themselves. I mean, there, there, as I say, there was 82 recommendations that made it into this final report and dozens that didn't. Um, and I don't expect anyone to have a, a, an encyclopedic knowledge of every single policy <laughs> in that report. Um, but is, was there any, uh, any there um, that, that, that you, Kevin, would caught your eye or you would like to highlight? Uh, some of the ones on buildings, and I think this is particularly pertinent to Scotland as well, were really interesting. Um, the, 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 the idea of this, 
a, a very rapid retrofit of, of all mm. Scottish households that are going to be still there in, say, 2050, and not just a, a sort of a light touch retrofit with a bit of draft excluder so we can tick a box in some civil servants uh, in tray, but actually much more that you know, there'll be deep retrofit to make sure that these properties were really good quality and that that would help um, eliminate fuel poverty, which was also recognised to be an, a, a huge issue and is a particularly big issue in Scotland. Um, and so I think retrofitting the existing um, houses was really important, but also that went along with ensuring that um, all new houses were passive house, or I think it might be passive house plus, in other words, were built to such a level where you require almost no heating in those properties. Yeah. Um, and we know how to do this. I mean, we've been doing it for years. I, I was recently visiting a number of houses when I was back in Sweden that had, that had, that had no heating for the last 14 years because they're a passive house in Sweden. They are a cold country. Um, yeah, so I think yeah. that this, this side was really important and, there was a, and, and, and was well ahead of what the government were proposing. Um, and I think that's, again, that plays out uh, as, it, as it provides some sort of, hopefully provides some courage to the policymakers to stand up to the incredibly conservative um, sort of building industry. So it's been building the same sort of what I would call pretty low quality houses for decades. And it seems very reluctant to be dragged into the 21st century and saying, you know, we need to be building pr properties for people that are both very low energy use and suitable for a changing climate as well. Um, and so, I, th I mean, hopefully these recommendations can really help the policymakers you know, drive some policy agenda that will, will deliver much better properties within Scotland. Yeah, and uh, I should say that I'm, I'm actually in the process of organising an interview with someone who's in, in the building industry uh, to talk about Passive House and the retrofitting challenge on a, on yeah. a future pos podcast. So I'm, I'm actually oh, really looking excellent. forward to that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, for, for, for me, one of the ones that really popped out was, um, I, well, there was two, then I'm a bit biased because of, there were two um, topics that I, I spoke about uh, when I was giving evidence, <laughs> but I was, I was so encouraged to see the, the ideas uh, be adopted as as uh, as enthusiastically as they were. Uh, one was for community tool libraries, um, where instead of having to buy power tools that then just sit in a shed or sit in a drawer for years not being used, we can just go down and borrow one whenever we need it. Um, and I, I, the the one thing that really caught my eye in the report was that the assembly generalised that issue, not just tools, but any, a much broader selection of, of resources and goods and services that right now we often buy but don't use at a full capacity so that therefore should maybe consider looking at borrowing or leasing instead. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. That was really important. And I think that came out more widely in that whilst the members were asked really to look at issues to do with climate change, and this was to their real credit here, they saw climate change as just as, as one of a suite of other challenges, um, in, environmental challenges, sustainability challenges, but also issues of fairness and, and, and ethics within Scotland. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because they weren't pushed in that direction, but that's yeah. one that, that, that very clearly emerged. So things like tool libraries, you wouldn't immediately think that's a very strong climate change implication, but it, it Actually, it does when you start to think of the materials in making these tools. But I think even more importantly, it's something that fosters an attitude of sharing and an attitude of community, which sometimes means we can actually be much, much lower emissions. So I think yeah. it's, not, it's not this, again, it's not the individual policies, but the sort of collective mindset that was behind those policies and they merged through this process that I see as, as, as key in changing the, the dialogue and the way that we look at these issues. Yeah, um, well, for... for uh, to, to just give a very uh, rough example of how that can affect things in terms of materials. If you've got 10 folk all buying a cheap power drill, mm. uh, but instead they can each go to the tool library and borrow one really high quality professional grade power tool. Um, everybody gets better power tools, but the power tool industry drops by 90% because you yeah, need yeah. to build one instead of 10. Yes. Um, I mean, I mean, I've seen this in, in part as a, as a keen cyclist. I spend a lot of time, I actually work um, at a Swedish university as well. And there's a lot of places over there where you have these, you can go in with your bicycle and there's all the tools there to fix and repair your bike, including somewhere that can, can help you with it as well. So rather than everyone having their own little sort of bike workshop at home, you can just go into your you know, local one in, in the middle of town. So you see that process actually at work there. So I'm, I'm all in favour of that. Um, and perhaps, and it wasn't, it wasn't pulled out a lot within the recommendations here, but even you can imagine extending that to things like cars. And there's a lot of more discussion around, around this sort of car sharing rather than necessarily owning your own car. So as we switched from petrol and diesel cars to electric vehicles, you know, do we all need to have our own 
electric vehicle. I mean, we've got 32 million private electric vehicles in the UK and um, probably 40 million in total, including fleet cars. Do we all really need that again in electric versions or should we just switch to maybe um, you know, rental um, or some sort of you know, local ownership model instead? So we can extend it from tools to, to other things as well. Yeah, and that's something that uh, actually particularly concerns me in my own life uh, where I live in a house that doesn't have a driveway but I also live in a street where there's actually quite limited space to, to park cars mm. and it's often very full. Uh, there's certainly not enough room to put in charging points for everybody's car. So if everybody in my street switched to electric vehicles, then it, it starts to become a bit of a struggle to, to work out how that actually works in practice. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is a, a pet subject of mine, which wasn't, which was brought up to some extent in the assembly. But it's just that now we've got this opportunity to to rethink our transport system. So we'd really switch from a whole load of petrol and diesel cars in a queue, trundling along at four or five miles an hour to get people into work, or you know, should we switch from that to electric vehicles all in a queue, trundling along at four to five miles an hour, or should we use this opportunity to rethink what transport in our urban and city and town environments should look like? And of course, we should be rethinking it. Sadly, at the moment, um, our policymakers are not doing that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I have been in discussions about, and with various levels of, of, the, the, of Scottish politics, especially at the local authority level, where you start to see these discussions happening. You start to see them talking to the kind of people who are giving them these kind of ideas, but you're still seeing it happening in a very fragmented process where people might say the right things and they might talk to some of the right people, but you're still not seeing that grand overarching strategy. And even with the, the willingness to do something, not necessarily the willingness to do that specific thing that needs to be done. There's still no, a bit no. of a gap there. There is indeed. I mean, it was actually interesting seeing some of the, the members' recommendations on things like an Oyster card for Scotland and having integrated rail as, I mean, it's easy to say integrated rail, but I mean, integrated transport has been this great myth in the UK for the last, well, for all of my life. <laughs> we still don't have it. Um, but you know, the idea we have some sort of integrated transport network with an Oyster card, with much more active travel within our towns and that we actually actively facilitate um, we, you know, walking and cycling and so forth. You know, these were all things that were pulled up yeah, very strongly within the assembly recommendations. So there's there's clearly a, a, an interest from you know from the citizens of Scotland for a different transport agenda. Do you think that is possibly what the, the, the big benefit of this assembly will be? And 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 demonstrating that willingness from the public almost gives the politicians permission to do these things. That that, that is really key in this is that the it, what what this has done is it's it's allowed the public to say we're prepared to consider these things so why aren't you considering them and that gives the policymakers the courage to start to come up with things that are different to the business as usual which is really what most policymakers seem to typically do incremental adjustments to business as usual but this actually says no we want you to come up with things that are much more um sort of you know we are prepared to accept more more radical policies that would drive a, a change in, in, how, in how we live our lives in scotland in, in a much more sort of positive progressive um, fashion and and this does this sort of a, does give that courage to or helps give that courage to the policymakers. so yes I'm, I'm really hoping that is the case and perhaps again like you were saying before we can have we have more of these you can imagine them focusing in say on transport so you can have a, a citizen assembly that actually focused in on the transport issues within scotland um and obviously which are very different between the rural environments and particularly scotland with, the, with all the highland and island communities and and the city and urban environments so that kind of segues us into the, the really the last question and and that I have to, to ask you today is what happens to the report now? It's, it's now been published. What, where does it go from here? Well, we, we're now waiting for the Scottish government's response to the report, um, and hopefully that will come before the the big international negotiation this year that's been held in Glasgow, which probably you know everyone hopefully is is familiar with the the, the COP process as they call it. So. Yeah. Um, hopefully we'll get a response from the Scottish government and that it won't, won't just be a, um, you know, a, something that's nicely produced and glossy, but will actually be a, a response that is thoughtful, as thoughtful as the members' efforts were in putting, putting together this report. So that's what we're waiting for next. And let's hope that the you know, excellent report from the members does provide the policymakers with a bit of courage here to, to move forward. Um, and not least, I think, one area we haven't touched on, just to, 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 just to um, make, make sure we don't leave that, uh, that elephant in the room, is what we're going to do with, with Scotland's, um, that the UK would like to think, think it belongs to the UK, but with Scotland's oil and gas industry. 
Mm. Um, that that is a real challenge and one that Scotland has really got to grapple with. And there was, you know, the, the members did talk about the idea about the rapid shift away from fossil fuels, from oil and gas, but that this has to be done in a just and fair way. Um, and so I think that's a really important key issue that the Scottish government cannot ignore. Yeah, I mean, Cobham Wheels are a member of the, the Just Transition Partnership up in uh, up here in Scotland, where we've been um, advising and feeding into uh, the, the discussions around how that transition takes place. Um, yeah. Because one thing Scotland has certainly learned from our own history is from things like uh, deindustrialisation and the, the decline of the coal industry is that a lot of communities who relied on those sectors have in the past simply been abandoned and that cannot happen again. No, no. And, 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 and of course, they're not just abandoned at that time, but as we've seen with a lot of the mining communities, you know, they have, those communities are wrecked for generations to come, yeah. for decades to come. So it's absolutely key that's not the case. But I think we also have to realise what we're up against here. I mean, the UK government's own oil and gas authority, this is the UK government's oil and gas authority, um, as its opening statement makes this claim that um, we work with industry and government to maximise the economic recovery of oil and gas and support the UK government, UK government in its drive to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. I mean, that is an oxymoron if ever you yeah. saw one. They're completely incompatible. And the Scottish government is going to have to tackle that if it's going to be serious about climate change. Yeah, at some point, the planet stops caring about your profit margins. It, it does. And, and again, that's a wonderful thing about this report from the members. I mean, they kept pointing out that, you know, that, that welfare, well-being and so forth has to go alongside and sometimes even trump issues to do with profit. So that that whole sort of political agenda, which I was very surprised to see emerging, was, had a very strong consensus amongst this very disparate group of Scottish citizens. So I guess this is the challenge for the politicians for the Scottish government who will, will be responding to, to the report. As, as you say, not to waste this opportunity and to waste the effort that has gone into this, to really take seriously these, these policy recommendations and, and hopefully to adopt as many of them as they can. Yes, yeah, but also not to not to use them as, you know, the, the, this assembly was not there just to provide piecemeal policies that the yeah. government could then adopt. It was there to provide um, an, an overview of the sorts of things that the Scottish society, the Scottish society um, is prepared to accept and is expecting the policymakers to deliver on. So it must not be not be used as an excuse for policymakers not delivering on other things that weren't necessarily covered by the, by the Scottish um, members in the in, in the assembly. Um, so it's, it must be seen as a as a holistic document that that sets a sort of a, if you like a, a sense of direction for the government as well as the actual policy recommendations themselves. Well, Kevin, I think we can't we can't finish on a, a better note than that. So, Kevin, <laughs> thank you for coming on to the podcast um, pleasure. today. It's been a, a, a fantastic chat with you. And just to finish up, as I always do, by reminding listeners that Commonweal is an organisation that is entirely funded by folk like yourselves who donate on av an average of about ten pounds a month. We don't have government funding. We don't have corporate sponsors. We don't even have adverts on our website. Everything we do, uh, from producing our policies to the public outreach that we we do to this podcast, is all supported by uh, by by folk like yourselves. So, if any of you can support us and help us carry on with our work, we'd greatly appreciate it. And with that, I'll be back next week. <laughs>